A lot of great games in the NAIA this weekend, so much so that uh, everything is the, the quick hitter today, dude. We're going to try and get through uh, you know, all the best stuff, starting off with the Franciscan Bowl, Matt? Can we the Franciscan officially? Bowl, officially. I think we can officially stake that claim. Okay. If we can't, I did it, so I really nice. don't care at this point. So, For those uh, unfamiliar with said bowl, <laughs> t- talk to me about these two squads. Yeah, so uh, St. Francis, Illinois, not to be confused with St. Francis, Indiana, who's the other team in this rivalry. Uh, obviously, they are very close in proximity to each other. They're on separate sides of the same state border, and uh, they're both pretty damn good football teams. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine that this rivalry in conference gets pretty heated, and it definitely did not disappoint 19-ranked St. Francis of Illinois loses to unranked St. Francis of Indiana who uh, received votes in the poll this week after the big win or is in the rankings. Number 22. Um, yeah, number 22. So good for them. They've had a sneaky good 7-2 and two season so far. Um, and this game was no exception. They slowed St. Francis of Illinois' run game down. Uh, that's what they really hung their hat on. Forced their quarterback to throw, who ended up going uh, 17 for 37. Clearly wasn't as comfortable airing it out, which worked to uh st francis indiana's advantage and they <laughs> get it done at home i'm trying to like i I'm, i probably just need to start using mascots because saints and cougars, cougars yes saints. yeah so uh the cougars in the blue there on the video get it done so uh absolutely great game from this squad proving that they are worth being in the top 25 yeah they were under a lot of people's radars mine included to start the year and they've just impressed so good for them Big time win, not the first of them when it comes to nationally ranked opponents. They've had, you know, a couple in back to back weeks, and we talked with uh, Josh earlier on. You saw the big man touchdown for them against Marion. Oh yeah, uh huh, dude, absolutely, dude. That was outrageous. <laughs> but no, they're playing all, all seriousness, playing some really good ball. The two blemishes on their record against an Indiana Wesleyan squad that we know what exactly what to expect from them, and then another uh, really solid team in Taylor. So those are the two losses right now, and you still have a chance for them. Everything's still ahead of them. They take care of business. Um, you would assume maybe potentially these next couple of weeks still have a lot of ball to be played. But move on. Campbellsville, a team that had an incredibly hot start to the season, still playing some really good ball against Bethel, a nationally ranked opponent. The Tigers get it done 14-10, dude. So if you, if I told you that Campbellsville uh, did not score in the second half, would you tell me they won this game? Most likely, no. Knowing football, I would say that that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Um, if I wasn't, if the box score was not right in front of me, then probably <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah, not even that. I'll one-up you. They only scored one quarter and they win 14 to 10 in what was a pretty gnarly uh, weather game for a little bit of this, uh, as you will see from the Bethel passing statistics, Kate Hewitt, two for 12 for 22 yards. Um, Clearly, while uh, Campbellsville didn't have problems airing out the ball, it clearly got to Bethel, Uh, not to mention Campbellsville's defense played absolutely lights out in the second half. The fact that your offense gets grounded to a halt by a very good Bethel defense and you're still able to put up enough of a fight after what I assume is a very exhausting second half yeah. and pull out a win is super impressive. Campbellsville still back at the top of the Mid-South after this win. And honestly, they are one win away against Georgetown next week from very seriously considering a playoff run. That they are, and, and look, taking a look at those those Mid-South standings, that's exactly where I was going with this as well. Georgetown, right now, just a step above, undefeated in sign of uh, the conference play at 4-0, and but Campbellsville, Lindsey Wilson, 3-1 and right behind them. Now, Lindsey Wilson does have the head-to-head over Campbellsville. That is their one loss on the year, so we'll see if, depending on the result this, you know, this coming week, we'll see what that does for them and if that will even come to, into play, but it seems like those three uh, have separated themselves from the rest of the competition, uh, are both Cumberland and Cumberland's teams, both playing some good ball, but not so much inside of conference play there. So, like you said, the, the big matchup this weekend, Georgetown College for this Campbellsville team. They finish out the year uh, against Cumberland's, that's plural, the Patriots. So that, that's not exactly a gimme either, but that Georgetown result is certainly going to determine a lot inside of the Mid-South. But yeah. Looking ahead to the matchups for next week, too, we get a lot of clarity. We usually have more clarity at this point in the season, but uh, yeah. we're finally cleaning things up. There's a lot of top 25 matchups to keep your eyes on. So, 
That there is another big time one. We'll go out west for this one. Top 25, number 21, Carroll, taking on number eight, Southern Oregon. Both these squads with a plethora of statement wins on the season. But uh, this time, talk, just talk to me. Talk to me about what happened in this one. This this Carroll team has defied all logic and is so close to finishing off the demon that is the chaos of the Frontier Conference. Um, they have only lost one conference game at the beginning of the season, mm-hmm. and they are rolling. And they beat Southern Oregon, who's one of the teams in their way, 21-17 in this fashion. Um they looked really good doing it. Obviously, Carroll has had massive home field advantage. They play in one of the sickest stadiums in the NAI. Yeah, one do. of the classic programs uh, of the NAI as well, uh, known for national title runs. Getting back to their roots, this Carroll team looks absolutely phenomenal. Jack Perka absolutely dialed in 22 for 31. 280 and a touchdown um, and a very balanced rushing and receiving uh, effort from this entire offense. They look good. Their defense looks good. And Carroll just might finish this thing off. It's certainly what it feels like. If I had the, did you see the the helicopter flyover at the beginning of this year as we rolled the tape? I'm gonna I did play not. that one more time for you right here. <laughs> Look at that! Oh wow, that is yeah, sick. I'm... Those aren't your normal. Those are the double copter type situation. Those things are sweet. I don't even know what those are called, but it gets me amped up i mean i would love to see that going over on game day dude it's it's different in the frontier man it's a whole different league out there um also i think it's worth mentioning gunner yates while uh losing still having a very productive day on the ground and uh in the receiving game uh over 60 yards and uh two touchdowns to his name uh, on both the rushing and receiving end so uh, still things to look forward to for this Southern Oregon squad, but now it's just Montana Western and Carroll, who again play next week at the top of the frontier. And I think uh, what's also worth noting about this Carroll squad is 7-1 right now. They lost to open up the year against a Montana Tech team that, yes, is a frontier conference team, but it's one of those situations where you got them twice. And yeah. that's actually could really come into play for this Carroll squad because they lose to Montana Tech, who was then the number 21 team in the country. And now, yes, you can't look ahead of this Montana Western squad or else you're going to be in a lot of trouble. But then you're at Montana Tech to close the year, and that in Butte, and that is the, uh, that's the conference game against those guys. So that really could come back to be a very influential piece of this if they can take care of business these next couple of weeks. Um, technically are undefeated inside of conference play right now, even though they've got a loss to that Montana Tech squad. Yeah, uh, very important for this Carroll team. They are close to slaying the demon, but they are not done. They have two weeks left. So um, I will believe it when I see it that the frontier chaos is dead, but for now it reigns supreme. So uh, good for the Saints. Yes, it does. Let's go down south. St. Thomas out of Florida still making waves, like I did there with that one. Um, But Mm. they take the win over uh, a southeastern squad that uh, quite literally has kind of been on fire. 20-17, to Bobcats win this one, Matt. Yeah, uh, this is a solid win for St. Thomas, obviously on the road in a hostile southeastern environment. Um, This game, to me, more so proved a lot more about Southeastern than St. Thomas. We already knew St. Thomas was a top five, very good football team. But Southeastern absolutely came to play. Holding Rontavious Farmer to 150 yards by any defense is honestly very impressive. Uh, Under five yards per carry for him, which is not very normal. Um, And Keely Watson, two picks on the day. Uh, This Southeastern defense really got after it. Obviously, St. Thomas is still a very good football team, so they ultimately win. But man, I Southeastern is looking like a sneaky playoff team because their only losses could potentially be to Kaiser and uh, number yeah. five St. Thomas. So, yeah, it's a uh, it's a good spot to be St. Thomas, surviving a couple slippery weeks in a row. Um, but you got to win your stinkers. So uh, <laughs> good for them for getting it done. And like I said, the Southeastern win is not a bad win by any means. And you talk about that man right there in the backfield for the Bobcats. Farmer is now the all-time rushing leader of any level of collegiate football in the state of Florida. Incredible. This was last week, by the way. This was October 26th. This isn't even based off this week's performance. He already eclipsed this mark, but we didn't. I don't know if we mentioned it on the show. That is a ridiculous statistic. 
Yeah, when I'm saying that Rontavious Farmer having 103, 133 yards rushing on the day is like low for him, that should be the indicator. That's borderline <laughs> lockdown. Yeah, I mean, we are talking like Ashton Genty times 30 right here. Like just <laughs> yardage upon yardage upon yardage. This guy gets it done, and uh, it's why St. Thomas is as good as they are is because Rontavious Farmer like just is the is the bull cow for this uh for the St. Thomas offense. I'm right with you there. And like you said, this Southeastern team, I mean, five and one heading into that game, right? And they had the game, looks like they had a game canceled against Florida Memorial. I think that was uh, mm -hmm. sort of like a hurricane type deal yeah. or something down there. But um, you close out the, the year with Ave Maria and Thomas and, you know, could, could stand to really have a good year. And like you said, those two losses, not a lot of moral victories there, but two not very bad losses on the, uh, on the schedule there for that, uh, for that squad. But we'll keep it going. Our pick for the game of the week this week, McPherson, Evangel. We had talked about this, had kind of hoped that it would live up to the expectations that we had for it when it came to the KCAC and uh, the implications there of conference standings. I think it did just about all of that. Yeah, uh, McPherson, a sleeper team that I had been looking at as a potential top 25 on my own list, and then they pull this off. And now I have to put them in my top 15 because this is just a fantastic win for them. Uh, this Evangel team has been rolling all season, and to go into their house and play like they played is mm -hmm. extremely impressive. Um, and not to mention, this now puts McPherson at the top of their division, the KCAC. They do yep. close out the year against friends in Southwestern, which yeah. will be two very big tests for them. But if I'm McPherson, I control my own destiny, and that's a fantastic spot to be. Evangel, obviously, with their first loss on the season here, unfortunately, and their first ever KCAC loss in school history. Um, because they've only been the KCAC for like two years. So. I was gonna say that's a relatively <laughs> yeah. new deal, but still a stat. Yeah. Stat that, yes. yes but you're right. That um, atop the Kessinger right now alone yeah. are, are the Bulldogs, and that's that's huge. Yeah, they've been building and building the past couple of years. We've been waiting for them to climb that hill, and they've been getting more wins. And this year's the year where they've clearly put it together. Um, just a fantastic effort all around. Need to give a shout out also to Jalil Brown on McPherson. Yes. Over 100 yards receiving with 115 on the day and 132 rushing yards and two touchdowns to boot. Incredible uh, backfield threat in both the rushing and receiving game. Talked about Gunnar Yates, how important it can be. And uh, Jalil Brown, like, one up to that performance. So He did. And he was one of our nominees for the Player of the Week awards. And I, I just... The awards are tougher every week to yeah. figure out who the hell gets them. And it's like every week someone just outdo outdoes the next person. It, it is yeah. absolutely outrageous and it's so hard to pick uh, from just it's one ridiculous. of those. But <laughs> it, it's crazy. But let's go. Uh, let's talk about number seven, Benedictine. And then at uh, number 12, Mid America Nazarene. This was a close one and was anything but a defensive struggle. Yeah, uh, there was no defense to be had here. Um, this was a shootout. Final score was 48-47. I will give a shout. Benedictine did lose, but they lived and died by the two-point conversion. Yes. And I can respect that 100%. Uh, the last touchdown of the game, the extra point attempt, uh, Benedictine went for two to put it away. Yep. And they did not get it. Jackson Dooley's pass fell incomplete. But, man, both these quarterbacks, Adrian uh, Parsons and Jackson Dooley, combining for 10 touchdowns, each throwing for 10 – or each throwing for five, excuse me. Um, and not to mention, man, the last, like, minute of this game was just chaos. Yeah. <laughs> like, pedal to the metal for both these squads of just, like, one last push to try and get it done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was the what ended up being the game-winning score here um, because, like you said, the of the failed two-point attempt there for the Ravens. But um, you, you talked also about that Adrian Parsons stat line. He won some, some Player of the Week honors as well. Very deservingly so. You take a look at the stats that he put up on Saturday. Check out. He is the uh, NAIA National Player of the Week for good reason. Mm -hmm. 374 yards and five touchdowns is a nice ring to it. I don't know what we got, like the Shadur here with the Apple Watch. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with the posing. We I could love it. maybe improve in that it. department. But uh, <laughs> on the field, he's doing just fine. Yeah, needs to get his defenders. Uh, he gets out the Compass app so he can direct the defense <laughs> since they're so lost. Um, that was terrible. I apologize. 
But I think it's worth mentioning what's not terrible were the receivers in this game. Benedictine had three receivers over 100 yards receiving. Uh, Mid-American Nazarene had just two. Um, rushing attacks for both games were great. And like I said, man, the quarterbacks balled out duly 20 for 32, 413 yards and five touchdowns. Parsons, 26 for 40, 374 yards, five touchdowns. My God. <laughs> Amen. A lot of scoring. That there was, and we'll finish it off at least with some of the highlights. The GPAC has kind of taken a back seat uh, on this program a little bit of some of these other conferences, KCAC, the Frontier, and I think it's a good little refresher to get right back into it. Morningside, Northwestern. I think this is exactly the kind of game that we've come to expect from these two squads. Yeah, I think I think them being in Iowa is detrimental because the Big Ten is like infecting everything around it <laughs> um, and making these disgusting low scoring games a thing. Usually this is a much higher scoring game, but it is fun to see that both these teams can play elite defense still. Um, my biggest note here is that while Morningside is having a very good end of their season, they're peaking at the right time. I'm a little concerned for Northwestern right now. Obviously, they dropped this game. They play Dort next week, whose hair yeah. is on fire. Dort also has the chance. This is the best year that we've seen for them to get their first win over Northwestern in school history. Yep. They've never beaten Northwestern in the rivalry game for the 17 or 18 years that they played it. So uh, Dort smells blood in the water after watching this one. Northwestern's offense... Uh, uncharacteristically not putting up a lot of points and same with boarding side, but man, it is, they have an interesting, interesting situation going on at Northwestern um, right now. I don't know. They don't look like a top 20 team to me. Like we've come yeah. to expect from them. Um, I'm very curious to see how the door game goes next week. Yep. Uh, so I think the way you put done. it perfectly, a blood in the water yeah. of like that. This is our window, right? This is our time to do it. And I think I'm sure that's kind of the maybe the unspoken rhetoric around there. I don't know if that's something that they would come out right and say, but um, finish it off with some quick hitters. Start off with the uh, with the mid south, dude. Back to it. Yeah, Lindsey Wilson. We talked about Lindsey Wilson, kind of on the outside looking in, gets a big leg up with a win over number twenty two Cumberland, twenty to seventeen, in an absolute scrap. Also, number 13, Georgetown, staying in the Mid-South, uh, scrapes by Cumberlands, plural, of Kentucky, oh, yeah. the Patriots, 19-16. to 16. And then after that, uh, number three, Indiana Wesleyan, outpaces Concordia Ann Arbor, Michigan, in a surprisingly high-scoring contest, 48-24, yeah. uh, to 24, Concordia putting up a good fight, but Indiana Wesleyan just continuing to put up 45-plus points every week is horrifying. Yep. And number one, Kaiser. Having, I wouldn't say like the biggest scare, like terrifying. Not, yeah, yeah. I'm not talking like 2007 Appalachian State over Michigan type <laughs> upset, but I'm talking like eyebrow raised. You know, uh, Kaiser surviving a scare against Weber, 34 to 20. Uh, Weber playing teams pretty close, so I will give them their respect. Uh, and like I said earlier, gotta win your stinkers, so they survive. Something to look forward to there. And something worth noting outside of the top 25 point three and six point defeated top seeded Pikeville in the AAC on a botched icing the kicker attempt. And by the way, they are still in contention for the, the conference title. How does that even work? Uh, because all three of their wins have come in conference. So they are three and one in conference. And since they beat top oh my gosh. ranked Pikeville, they are now tied with Pikeville and have the tiebreaker over Pikeville. Um, and for clarification that. on the botched icing, the kicker, as in went for the game-winning field goal, missed the game-winning field goal, but they called a timeout, so they got to redo it, and they point kicks the field goal to win the second time. Unreal. I mean, you look at <laughs> you look at their losses, too, this year. Like you had mentioned, three and six. You open the year at Bethel. Then you come back at home against Lindsey Wilson. Then you're at D1 Davidson at yeah. D2 Allen. What a f that's a gauntlet. That is a really tough way to open the year. You start the year 0 and 5. Yeah. And I now mean, here we are I... winning three out of your last four. And you kind of mentioned getting hot at the right time, right inside a conference play. And you've got a Union Commonwealth team coming in 
uh, to town next week that I'll be honest, I have no clue about them. And then you're at Bluefield in Virginia. It should be, you would imagine, a decent contest. But, yeah, wow. Union Commonwealth, a team that's kind of come up from the ground. Uh, they were not winning at all, and now they're winning a little bit. So they're okay. a decent team and doing well this year, but point. But that like, Pikeville like, win, I mean, that's statement. That's <sighs> huge. That's huge. And even if people want to argue with the ending, like you still won at the end of the day. So that's that. But yeah, look at that three way tie at the top of that conference. Um, I think Pikeville still is a buy. So they're four and one, but obviously three and one. Reinhardt would usually win in most years, but they're having an off year. They're five and four. Um, still at the top of the conference. But yeah, the AAC is chaotic as ever. I have no idea what's going on. Um, and hopefully we'll get some more answers about the playoffs uh, this weekend. Yeah. There's a lot of top 25 matchups on. Hopefully we can talk a little bracketology. I would like um, that. That'd be cool. I, yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love to, but we'd be here for like an hour because there's still so many hypotheticals that can happen. Um, I can't get over you know, starting 0-5 and, and potentially winning your conference. Isn't it crazy? I'm still I there. Mean, I'm, my brain's still there. You play so few conference games in the AAC that like, I understand why you would just want to go play a bunch of good teams and see where you stack up. But like at some point you got to be worried about like <laughs> your standing, right? NAI that's still like you win the conference. That's still an automatic bid. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. as long as, as long as they went out, like, wow. So then there really is, that's yeah. an incentive for them to go out and like you said, play all of literally the best competition, get a great measuring stick. And then you come in and it's like, being in the on deck circle swinging two bats. Yeah, no kidding. That's, that's literally <laughs> what it's like. And not to mention all the out of conference competition for these teams is in the mid south, which yeah. has been very, very good mm-hmm. in recent years. And now you add Campbellsville to that mix of teams they could put, potentially play with how good they are. It's, I mean, they are not dodging the smoke, and it is, hell yeah. It hasn't been them in the ass yet, man. Oh, 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 oh,